Hey now, it's time for my Godzilla Minus One review with spoilers. So if you haven't seen the movie yet and don't want all the surprises and details ruined, leave now. This is an environment of welcoming and you should just get the hell out of here. The movie opens towards the end of World War II. The first scene has us follow Koichi Shikishima, played by Yunosuke Kamiki. He lands his plane on an island so it can be inspected by the Japanese military mechanics. However, Koichi is a kamikaze pilot and is lying about his plane having issues in order to avoid the mission. I know most people probably know what the kamikaze were, but for those who don't, the kamikaze mission during World War II was to fly their planes into enemy ships, typically losing their life in the process. This was a desperation ploy as Japan was losing the war at that point. The kamikaze unit got their name, meaning Divine Wind, from the two typhoons that protected Japan during the Mongol invasions of 1274 and 1281. Almost 4,000 pilots would die doing these missions and they would kill thousands of U.S. and Allied military personnel. U.S. sailors reportedly gave them the nickname Baka Bombs, or Stupid Bombs. The kamikaze and how they're portrayed in media is still a contentious topic even to this day. However, this is not unfamiliar territory for director Takashi Yamazaki. In previous videos, I've already talked about his experience with Godzilla. He had the monster appear in his 2007 film, Always, Sunset on 3rd Street 2, and he directed Godzilla the Ride, Giant Monsters Ultimate Battle for the Seibuen Amusement Park. But he also directed the 2013 movie The Eternal Zero, a war drama based on the novel of the same name written by Naoki Hyakta. That movie deals heavily with the kamikaze subject, and Yamazaki had some critics and peers in the industry come out against the movie, with some critics claiming the movie was glorifying the war and the kamikaze, and other critics not happy that it appeared it was criticizing high-ranking Japanese government officials. Yamazaki would respond, Quote, the film depicts the war as a complete tragedy, so how can you say it glorifies war? I really don't get it. End quote. In the lead up to this movie, I saw some comments regarding the trailers voicing a similar concern, that Yamazaki might be trying to show the Japanese as innocent victims of World War II with this sort of woe is me framing. But I don't see that at all here. What I see is a director showing that again, war is a tragic thing that most often the common people bear the cost of. And quite the contrary to the woe is me claim, and despite all the destruction and sad scenes in this movie, there is an undercurrent of optimism in Godzilla Minus One, with one of the themes being getting over the trauma of war and putting the past behind you to build a brighter future for those you love. Anyhow, our protagonist doesn't just land on any island. It's an island with a name us Godzilla fans are quite familiar with. Odo Island. The fictional island was first mentioned in the 1954 original, and it's where we see Godzilla for the first time as he appears over the hillside. On the shoreline of the island, Shikishima notices dead fish popping up in the water. Or at least I think they're dead fish. To be honest, I wasn't sure what they were when I first saw the movie, though I've seen others say it's dead fish, so I'll go with that. This is an interesting foreshadowing for what's to come. If you remember from the first Godzilla, the inhabitants of Odo Island were once said to tie girls to rafts and send them out to sea as a sacrifice to Godzilla when fishing was poor. So the idea that this minus one Godzilla brings with it dead sea life on its arrival is a nice throwback and a pretty grim calling card. We quickly get to nighttime on Odo Island, when Shikishima and the rest are startled by a loud roar. I was startled as well. I saw this movie in the Toho Cinema's Habiya Theater, and the sound system there is tremendous. This roar scared the shit out of me. I did not expect it, and the roar did not remind me of Godzilla. It sounded like something more out of Jurassic Park. The Spinosaurus, for example. What's a bad idea? That's a Tyrannosaurus. I don't think so. This sounds bigger. Just a booming sound. I believe it's at this point one of the men bring up the Odo Island legend of Gojira. And here is where the movie goes from zero to a hundred. With very little warning, Godzilla charges out of the darkness and starts attacking everyone like a pissed off bear. It is as intense as we've ever seen him. However, the Godzilla we see here doesn't look like the one from the trailers. This is a pre-mutated or pre-irradiated Godzilla. What I'm showing on screen is a Bandai toy of the creature. I don't have any screenshots from the movie I can find, but I feel like the toy doesn't really do it justice. Also, I recall it having a more horizontal posture, but maybe I'm just misremembering. Again, I've only seen the movie once. In terms of size, it's bigger than a T-Rex, but much smaller than the 1954 Godzilla. 
but this Godzilla is extremely aggressive, and he goes after everyone on the island. The men fire their guns, but it's mostly useless. Godzilla doesn't eat anyone, which is typical, that's never been his thing, but he grabs a few guys with his mouth and just sort of tosses them into oblivion. I think he steps on a few as well. Try to think of 1991's Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah with the Godzillasaurus attacking people, but just take that up like a hundred notches in intensity. Now, like I said, the scene takes place at night, but what's great is you get so many good looks at him despite the dark setting. The men try to plan some sort of counterattack that would have had Shikishima get into his plane and use the gun on the plane to kill Godzilla or to chase it off. Take that, you dinosaur! But he is frozen with fear and is unable to do anything as the monster kills almost everyone. Only himself and the mechanic Tachibana, played by Munetaka Aoki, survive. For the remainder of the movie, Shikishima is haunted by survivor's guilt. He even has a nightmare later on of Godzilla that is reminiscent of the Odo Island scene from the first movie. I was thrilled they had a scene like this right away. It takes place within the first five or ten minutes of the movie. I've gotten sort of tired of always having to wait like 40 minutes for Godzilla to appear in these films and the slow burn, uh, constant tease approach. And yeah, he's not in his traditional mutated form here, but it was still highly entertaining to get that right off the bat. It was also smart because it starts the protagonist character arc and gives us meaningful Godzilla screen time in an efficient manner. This also gives the movie a cushion. They now have some time to set the pieces for the rest of the story in the following scenes without us nutjobs fidgeting in our seats demanding monster action. After the war is over, Koichi returns to his home in Tokyo. I might be misremembering, but I believe the movie takes place between 1945 and I think 1947 or 48. Tokyo is completely bombed out. It's mostly in ruin, depicting the dark and dreary aftermath of the Allied firebombings of the major Japanese city, which by some estimates killed somewhere between 75,000 to 200,000 civilians and made over a million people homeless. In the movie, we see the folks that survived living in these crudely put-together huts. The Tokyo set pieces are convincing and portray the ruinous state of the city much like it's described in history books. As someone who likes studying history, I think it's good that Yamazaki chose to show Tokyo in this state and focus on the devastation there. Often in the United States when World War II, and specifically the conflict between Japan and the U.S. is discussed, Pearl Harbor and the atomic bombings consume most of the discussion. But the bombing of Tokyo is possibly the most destructive bombing campaign in history, and yet it usually just doesn't get talked about in the same way as the other events. It's in Tokyo where Shikishima sees his family home reduced to rubble and he learns of his family's death. He appears to get scolded by Sakura Ando's character, Sumiko, who I believe is just a neighbor of the family. I couldn't follow some of this dialogue, but Shikishima learns of his family's death from Sumiko. And seeing Ando was really cool because she's a really good actress. She was in Hirokazu Koraeda's Shoplifters uh, and was recently in his new movie, Monster. If anything, she's underutilized here. Koichi soon meets a woman named Noriko, played by Minami Hamabe, and Noriko's family was also killed in the bombings. There is a great chemistry between Hamabe and Kamiki, which is no surprise they already starred together on the Japanese TV show Ranman. Noriko and Shikishima start living together and get close. Throughout the movie, Noriko is the one shining light in Shikishima's dark psyche. Despite there being a romance, in true Japanese Godzilla movie style, we don't really see any displays of affection other than a couple of embraces. It is funny to think that of all the Japanese Godzilla movies, Nick Adams' kiss of Kumi Mizuno is still the most sexual act out of any of the 30 plus movies. Well, as far as humans go anyway. Their relationship begins when they take in an infant. I believe her name is Akiko, and her parents were, you guessed it, also killed. As we watch this patchwork family grow, we then see a CG recreation of the 1946 nuclear weapons test named Operation Crossroads. The specific footage depicted is the second test, which was named Baker, and you've probably all seen this video I'm showing here. This is the Baker shot. 
It's perhaps the most famous video of a nuclear explosion ever taken. It's used in a bunch of movies. The reason it's so famous is because the blinding light that usually obscures the view happened underwater, as did the detonation, which allows us to get a clear visual. We quickly see a glimpse of Godzilla roaring in pain after this. It's a quick scene, and its purpose is to just let us know that Godzilla has now been irradiated. This is a slight difference from the original Godzilla, which was mutated by a hydrogen bomb from the Castle Bravo test in 1954. This minus one Godzilla is mutated by the fission-based atomic bomb in 1946. And then my dreams of seeing Nicolas Cage as Douglas MacArthur are dashed. They chose to show real footage of MacArthur over reports of a large creature attacking and destroying U.S. ships. But due to the Cold War tension starting, the U.S. is hesitant to send any heavy military into the area out of fear of starting conflict with the Soviet Union. So basically, the U.S. is not going to be cleaning up its own mess here. Godzilla will be Japan's problem to deal with. Overall, it is an interesting choice to not have the Allied powers, or more specifically, not have the Americans be visible in post-war Japan. When the first trailer dropped, I was curious how this would be handled. Japan was occupied territory for the Allied powers during this time period. It could just be a stylistic choice, or that Yamazaki wanted this story to focus solely on the Japanese, emphasizing that Japan had to chart out its own future even as it was occupied. As Koichi is still dealing with trauma from his past actions, Noriko strikes out to get a job working in the Ginza district of Tokyo. Koichi gets a job for himself as a minesweeper, working on a boat with the men who would become his close buddies over the course of the film. Out of all the work colleagues, I think scientist Kenji Noda, played by Hidetaka Yoshioka, is the standout here. A lot of the scenes involving these guys, and Noriko too, is where you get the more lighthearted moments and some joking around. Koichi is such a serious character that it's good they had others there to break the tension a bit. Godzilla's first major appearance in his mutated, irradiated form comes out at sea when the men are mind-sweeping. And we see the calling card first. The dead fish appear all around them, and Shikishima knows what that means. It's quite the oh shit moment. The entire scene is amazing. There's even a moment when Koichi turns into Chief Brody from Jaws, shooting at and blowing up a mine in Godzilla's mouth. I think I would have fell off my chair if we got a smile, you son of a, in Japanese. It's also here that we see Godzilla's healing factor, which is faster than ever before, and he's able to quickly regenerate from the damage. And I have to say, the CG in this movie is really good, but... Here is where it shines. It, it's impeccable here. I mean, I'm sure somebody could, with a better eye than me, can find some things that don't look so right or so good. But, I mean, there are moments where they have close-ups of Godzilla here, and it looks like a prop. It does not look like CG. It's, um, it's just really impressive. If that wasn't enough, we get to see Godzilla do battle with the Japanese cruiser left over from the war. I'm a huge fan of the water scenes from the old Godzilla movies. I'm partial to the one from Ebira, Horror of the Deep, and 1992's Godzilla vs. Mothra. That being said, this movie may have some of the greatest water scenes in the franchise's history. Now, I'm not going to get into every detail, but our main cast does survive that ordeal. Later on, Godzilla attacks again. This time, he makes landfall and he makes landfall heading for Ginza, where Noriko is. This is the attack you see in most of the trailers. When Godzilla is shown entering Ginza, the Akira Ifukube Godzilla theme starts blasting, and it's played up in this epic manner as we get a full shot of the monster. I think the fans who didn't like the design of Shin Godzilla will be happy with this Godzilla, as it has a more traditional style to it. I wouldn't be surprised if we hear some criticism that the Ifukube drops are forced and that they don't fit in with the rest of the score. But I always love when they use Akira Ifukube's uh, theme for Godzilla. To me, it's the Godzilla theme, and it's almost weird when it's not used. That being said, there's been some other good themes over the years, like the theme in Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. Michiro Oshima did a tremendous job on that. This Ginza attack is where we see the power of this Godzilla on full display. He has that same tenacity he had on the island before the mutation, but is just much larger now. You can see the many masses getting swept up in his assault. He uses his tail, his sheer size, and it's just those penetrating eyes that Yamazaki gave this Godzilla 
that really gets under your skin. Noriko is on the train when this attack is going on, and as is the tradition, Godzilla can't help but play with the trains. He picks up the train she's on, and Noriko is left hanging at one point, uh, and eventually falls into the water where she survives. Unfortunately, she finds herself again in his path, looking rather shell-shocked. Here, Shikishima heroically arrives and saves her. Then the Japanese military, or what's left of it, bring out some old tanks to try and stop Godzilla. And this is where we get the coup de grace. Suddenly, the camera shifts to Godzilla's tail and works its way up as we see his dorsal plates jut out further than normal one by one, lighting up blue. He inhales deeply like the big bad wolf. The dorsal plates quickly trigger back into its body like a gun, and then, bang. He unleashes an atomic breath that is basically a nuclear bomb. There's no other way to describe it. It's reminiscent of the 2001 GMK Godzilla's atomic attack, but the devastation we see is not comparable to anything we've seen in a Godzilla movie before. Maybe Shin Godzilla, but this feels way more real. As the shockwave is sent out, Noriko sacrifices her life by pushing Shikishima behind a building or, or an alleyway, and she just wears the blast and is seemingly killed. This is a bit of a nitpick I had. If she's going to push him into an alleyway or behind a building or whatever to save him, I mean, technically, she could have just dove at him and they both would have been saved. Or they could have just had her push him into a hole or something, because why would he survive when almost every building is getting pancaked but I guess the one he's behind doesn't. Again, that's not a big deal, but I do remember thinking that while watching. We then see the atomic breath aftermath. It just blots out the sky like it's causing a mini nuclear winter. It leaves a massive crater and a mushroom cloud that produces the same type of black rain that fell after the atomic bombings during World War II. Koichi, with his face being hit with the drops of the black rain, looks up and sees the monster roaring almost victoriously. It's a pretty epic shot. Shikishima screams in anger, and here was such a powerful moment because I remember thinking, okay, I almost never root against Godzilla, but we gotta kill this bastard. You really feel the anger of Shikishima, who already lost everything, and Japan in general. As I said, they did a good job showing Tokyo in ruins before this Godzilla attack, and now it's even worse. So for those wondering what the name Minus One meant, they already explained it in a press release, but again, I'll explain it. In short, Japan was at a state of zero after the war, and now Godzilla has plummeted them to even below that. So just when you're recovering from that Godzilla attack, the next scene really hits you in the gut as well. They show Shikishima and the rest of the gang telling the young Akiko that Noriko has died. Noriko is the one who raised her, and now she's gone. And I don't know the name of the child actress, but her crying hit me like a ton of bricks. And maybe I'm a softie, but it got to me. I teared up in the theater. And there's another scene later on when she cries again before the final battle. And that again is heartbreaking. I thought she stole the show. I mentioned that in my previous video. Maybe just seeing a little kid cry is tough for me. I don't know what to tell you. I think it also has to do with the placement of the scenes. I mean, you have Godzilla, that whole big attack. You go from this just sort of excitement from seeing Godzilla fully on screen and he's attacking the city. Like, this is what we're here for, to see him attacking Ginza, to see him destroy a city. And then immediately afterwards, you're like, ah. That bastard, we gotta we gotta kill this guy now. It reminded me a lot of The Sopranos with David Chase and the character Tony Soprano. He lamented how the audience would root Tony on while he was doing all these terrible things throughout the show. And then towards the end of the show, they were begging for him to kill Tony, kill Tony. Kind of reminded me of that. All I know is you never had the makings of a varsity athlete. A son of a bitch! After that attack, the citizens are basically informed that the Japanese government isn't going to be able to help and that they need to solve this themselves. I do still need to see the subtitled version because I, I didn't quite understand why the Japanese government declined to help, so I apologize. That I'm not sure of. So basically, there's no U.S. support, no world support, no government support. The citizens of Japan and the veterans from the war are on their own to stop this monster. So the final hour or so of the movie is them preparing for their final confrontation with Godzilla and then the confrontation itself. The scientist Kenji is who comes up with the plan to kill the monster. It's one of the more unique ways to stop Godzilla we've ever seen. And again, it's sort of like Jaws in a way. The first plan is to try to drag him deep underwater, hoping that the pressure will kill him. And then if that doesn't work, they have these balloons quickly inflate and have Godzilla get sent back up to the surface really fast. Sort of like how Quint and Jaws used the barrels to try and tire out the shark. 
But the idea here is that if they can bring Godzilla's body up to the surface quickly enough, he'll be destroyed via explosive decompression. Shikishima's part of the plan is to get Godzilla's attention while flying his plane and get him out to the part of the ocean where a bunch of ships will enact Kenji's plan. He convinces Tachibana, the mechanic from the beginning of the movie, to make special alterations to the plane. They really lay it on thick here and give you the impression that Shikishima is planning on dying during this mission against Godzilla which means Akiko will be left without Noriko and now Shikishima as well, losing her parents for a second time. The final battle with Godzilla is as dramatic as it can be. It also looks amazing. It also sounds amazing too, because again, they play a, a Nifakube piece here. I believe it's the 1962 King Kong vs. Godzilla score, and it, it works really well. However, the plan hits a few roadblocks with Godzilla... I believe he pops the balloons that they were using to drag him up to the surface. And in a dramatic moment, more ships arrive full of uh, war veterans and common people to help them pull Godzilla to the surface. It reminded me a lot of that scene from the movie Dunkirk with all the regular boats helping evacuate the soldiers. They succeed in lifting Godzilla to the surface and the decompression damages Godzilla, but it isn't enough to kill him. He starts to rev up the atomic breath, and everybody solemnly starts preparing to die. It's just an unbelievable moment. Just as Godzilla is about to unleash his atomic breath, the movie sound goes silent. And then we see Shikishima's plane flying directly for Godzilla's mouth. He pulls a Russell K, Independence Day style. And here's where you think he's going to fulfill his kamikaze mission. But we find out that the mechanic built in an ejection seat. So Koichi ejects right before nailing Godzilla. The monster's head basically blows up because the atomic breath backfires and his body proceeds to fall apart into the ocean. The whole movie... Shikishima is haunted by the war and by Godzilla, and here we're led to believe he's finally going to fulfill the kamikaze mission he abandoned during the war and kill the monster he was too afraid to fight on Odo Island. But no, the kamikaze is not glorified here. If anything, it's flipped on its head. Koichi decides to fight for a future for his loved ones by living on, not throwing his life away. You might be wondering, well, isn't self-sacrifice a noble thing? Well, yeah, it is. But the movie isn't criticizing self-sacrifice itself. It's all about the context here. During World War II, the Japanese military did everything they could to make the kamikaze mission and the war in general sound honorable and glorious despite the suicidal nature of it. And we see where that led the country of Japan and the people in it. The movie does a good job showing this by having all the characters be touched by the war in some way. Their leaders led them into a disastrous conflict, and now another disaster is taking place, and it's up to the regular people to save the day. It's a rejection of the senseless death that took place during the war at the behest of leaders that abandoned their people, and a spark of hope for a country that was at rock bottom. Shikishima chose the future over the past. And it's something that I think director Ishiro Honda would have agreed with, being a veteran of war himself. Amongst the celebrations, Shikishima receives a telegram from Sumiko. He rushes to the hospital. And there we see, Noriko has survived. We went from them potentially both being dead by film's end to them both surviving. Some may disagree with the decision to have her live, but I'm a sucker for a happy ending, so I was glad she survived. Also, like I said earlier, this movie has an undercurrent of optimism. It's not the bittersweet or melancholy ending that 1954's movie had. Though, depending on how this last part is supposed to be understood, maybe the ending isn't so happy. The movie goes out of its way to show the back of Noriko's neck. And I had to do a double take here. You see some sort of mark on her skin and it appears to move a little too. I've only seen the movie once, so I, I need to pay closer attention to this part, but I think it could be either of two things. One, it's just showing that she has radiation poisoning, which if that is the case, I don't mind that touch so much because it's in line with a lot of what Godzilla represents. The other possibility is that the mark is implying that Godzilla's blood or DNA is now part of her biology, which is probably how she survived the blast, the regenerative properties of Godzilla. I would hate if that's what they were going for here. It just doesn't fit the movie at all. The film is very much grounded in reality, with the exception of the giant monster. I mean, in a Godzilla movie, the giant monster is a given. But everything else is realistic. And then we get what? Zombie Noriko? 
or human Godzilla hybrid Noriko. We're doing this again. Anyhow, I just hope that is not what Yamazaki was going for there. If it's radiation poisoning, that works much better. I'm sure people will find meaning in that too. You can maybe look at it and say Noriko represents Japan here, surviving the atomic bomb, or in this case Godzilla, but forced to live with the after effects, something like that. Now, that is not the last part of the movie. The movie then cuts to the ocean, and we see a part of Godzilla's flesh regenerating, leaving the door open to his return in the future. And then the movie ends. Overall thoughts? Godzilla Minus One is a well-paced two-hour movie that will appeal to all moviegoers rather than just Godzilla fans, but believe me, I think most Godzilla fans will be extremely happy with this. Godzilla is a ferocious, angry beast here, and I said it before, but I was genuinely scared of this Godzilla, mostly because of the eyes and its overall pissed off attitude in the film. Seeing how Godzilla's flesh changes from the damage it takes throughout the movie is just a a testament to how well Yamazaki is at his craft. The balance between Godzilla's screen time and the human story is perfect, in my opinion. Some folks might find the stretch between the Ginza attack and the final battle to go on a bit long, but I can't say enough how impressed I am with the visuals, the pacing, the story, the characters, and Godzilla's time on screen. Now, obviously, I didn't like everything. Some of the parts between Noriko and Shikishima are a little overdone and melodramatic. As I said, I love the visuals and the overall presentation, but there are some bad angles where Godzilla looks a bit off, but I think they did a better job than Shin Godzilla in that regard. I did notice a few things with uh, smaller surrounding effects. There's one scene where it's snowing, and they do use, I think, some practical effects there, but it's very noticeable when the computer-generated snow is floating in front of them. And it's the same thing for a few parts where smoke is shown in front of people. It just looks obviously imposed. Now I said the CG is great, but I guess that's technically only because I'm comparing it to other Japanese movies. Fact is, I almost don't expect the same level of computer graphics in Japanese productions as I do in American ones, and I'm genuinely curious why that is. Why don't Japanese movies have the same quality in that regard? And I know some American movies, the CG doesn't always look good either, but I see this issue more in Japanese movies. Is it a money thing, a talent thing, or some combination of both? I'm genuinely asking, I have no idea, so I'm sure those of you out there that know this craft can probably spot more problems with the CG than I can, just as a layman watching the movie. Honestly, my biggest complaint about the movie might be the last 20 seconds, and I guess the severity of the complaint depends on how we're supposed to take that mark on her skin. As for the final visual with the regenerating flesh, we know Godzilla can return at any point. It's sort of his deal. I don't need to see a regenerating mass of flesh to believe he can come back. So again, I I don't think that was needed. And it's also way too similar to the ending of 2001's GMK, which showed the monster's heart beating at the end. It also opens you up to the criticism of, well, you built up all this sacrifice that the characters made to stop Godzilla. Doesn't this make it meaningless because he's just going to come back? I wouldn't agree with that type of criticism here because, listen, you know, even if they bought themselves five years of peace by stopping Godzilla, that doesn't that doesn't make it meaningless. In terms of comparing this to Shin Godzilla, I love both films. They're just two different approaches to an earnest Godzilla movie. Shin is more procedural. We see how the government and experts are handling the crisis. But in Minus One, we get more personal in terms of the characters, and it's the common people organizing to stop the problem. Shin's themes have to do with contemporary issues like the natural disaster and subsequent bureaucratic nightmare. Minus One's themes are more about overcoming the horrors of war and how to properly move forward. The style of destruction in Shin at times resembles something more out of an anime, especially when he starts firing the lasers everywhere, whereas Godzilla Minus One has a more realistic aesthetic to it. Now, I want to address a few things I said in my spoiler-free video. Firstly, let me say, when I made that video, I had just gotten to Japan a couple of days earlier. I was exhausted, jet-lagged, and fighting with my microphone. So in order to complete the video in a timely manner, I decided to just do a more off-the-cuff style review, and because of that, I phrased some things poorly. One thing I said was that this movie has no plot armor, which sounds silly because none of the main characters die, but 
what I was trying to convey was that when you're watching this movie for the first time, you really do feel like no one's safe, especially after Noriko seemingly dies. Another comment I made, I said this movie goes through the whole gamut of emotions, which I do love, and it does do that very well. But then I said it does it better than any other Godzilla movie, and I specifically mentioned the original movie. The problem is, that doesn't make sense, because the original and other Godzilla movies aren't all trying to do the same thing, so it doesn't make sense for me to phrase it that way. I was just trying to emphasize my preference for this type of movie. I also made a comment that this movie has the most well-written characters in a Godzilla movie, which I think I still stand by, but there's other characters in the series I might prefer over this one, it could go either way. I mean, my opinions change all the time on this stuff. I like Dr. Sarazawa. I like Dr. Mafune and Katsura from Terror of Mechagodzilla. I like Akane from Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. And I've always liked Megumi Odaka's Mickey character, though I'll admit she's not the most well-written character in most of the movies. But either way, if Shikishima, Noriko, Kenji, and the rest of the gang are not the best, they're definitely in the upper echelon. I predicted people would start calling Godzilla Minus One the greatest Godzilla movie ever, and I've already seen a few videos and articles making that claim. I'm not sure yet if I'm there with that, I want to let this movie breathe for a while. But hey, I think that's totally fair. If you have good reasoning to make that claim, then go for it. I love those conversations because I think it's fun. I had so much fun ranking the Showa era movies earlier this year and reading your comments vehemently disagreeing with my rankings. Seriously, it's a good time, and I'm probably going to make separate videos ranking Heisei and Millennium as well. Sadly, there are some people who can't have those types of conversations. They just fly off the handle. I mean, we're talking about movies here and they, they act like you punch them in the face. They're the same people who, if you even suggest that any of the other 30 plus Godzilla movies did something better than the original, they will treat you as a, a blasphemer and they'll start hitting you over the head with the backstory of the first movie. As if what a movie is based on is the end-all be-all for film criticism. It would be like me saying Godzilla vs. Hedera is the best Godzilla movie because Bono was influenced by the victims of pollution and Minamata disease. That's nonsense. I love the original Godzilla. Reading about the history of that movie is the reason I made my Godzilla video series the way I did. The movie transcended the medium. It was expressing something real, tragic, and specific to the Japanese people. But that doesn't make the movie itself immune to criticism, and it doesn't mean other Godzilla movies can't surpass it in certain ways. I feel the need to say this because I've gotten some comments recently on this subject, and I just couldn't disagree more with those people. If some people want to make the case that Minus One surpassed the original or is better in certain ways, all the power to them. So, like I mentioned earlier, I saw this movie in Tokyo at the Hibiya Toho Cinemas, and one of the first things they put on the screen when I sat in my seat was this tremendous Boss Coffee commercial. And Boss has had a lot of these over the years. I definitely recommend you check them out. A lot of good Godzilla stuff. This one ad they ran, it just got me so pumped up before the movie. I think they showed every single feature film Godzilla on the screen at one point. It was really well done. When the movie ended, the entire audience started clapping, which I was stunned because I thought that was an American thing. I feel like Americans, we get mocked all the time for clapping when, when an airplane lands, for, when a, <laughs> for whenever a movie ends. We get called Americlaps online. I saw a lot of Japanese parents bringing their kids to see it. So for you parents out there, I, I don't see anything wrong with bringing your kids. They'll love when the giant dinosaur is on the screen and they'll probably be bored when he isn't. There isn't any human gore that I remember, so you don't need to worry about that. When I walked out of the theater, the area outside was packed with people because they were holding the Godzilla Day festivities. It was funny because when I walked into the theater before the movie, there was only a few people around while they were setting things up. And then two hours later, there were people everywhere. I didn't know this at the time, obviously, but Hideo Kojima was standing like a few feet away from me and I didn't know it because the guy with the Top Gun shirt over here he was in front of me also, Sneaky Kojima. The event itself was a lot of fun. Besides all the little shops and statues they placed outside, we got to see Godzilla vs. Megalon 2023 on the big screen and Fest Godzilla 4 Operation Jet Jaguar. 
Godzilla vs. Megalon 2023 is part of a series of CG-rendered Godzilla short films. These started in 2019 with a fan-made short film titled G vs. G, and then Toho would then go on to make a sequel titled Godzilla vs. Gigan Rex in 2022, which was unbelievable. Fest Godzilla 4, Operation Jet Jaguar, is part of a separate series of short films that are made with practical effects and suitmation. This series started back in 2020 with Godzilla Appears at Godzilla Fest, followed by 2021's Godzilla vs. Hedera. I think it's great that Toho has these two separate series running now because it offers something for everyone. For the more fantastical shit, you have the CG movies, which possibly take place during the Heisei continuity, though I don't think Toho has confirmed this. The Godzilla in Godzilla vs. Gigan Rex is implied to be Junior from the Heisei era, and Megumi Odaka lends her voice to the film. But if you don't care for the computer animated stuff, you could always enjoy the suitmation fights between Godzilla and other monsters with the Fest Godzilla series. Toho recreated the Jet Jaguar suit this year and even had Jet Jaguar himself appear at Godzilla Day. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was not there for this part. I had other stuff to do. I know. But I didn't just travel to Japan for Godzilla, as shocking as that may seem. So I did not get to shake Jet Jaguar's hand, and I'll always regret it. Something else that was cool from a historical perspective, Toho was celebrating the life of Ichizo Kobayashi, who was born 150 years ago. He was an extremely important figure in Japan and is best known as the founder of Hankyu Railway, the Takarazuka, which was an all-female musical theater troupe, and of course, he helped found Toho. When I had gotten a tour a few years ago of the Toho offices in Hibiya, I did notice that they had a portrait of Kobayashi in one of their conference rooms. Just one last thing regarding the promotion for Godzilla Minus One. I've never seen so many just marketing and cross-promotional stuff in my life. One promotion I forgot to mention in my last video, and I did plan on going there, but it just it ended up not working with my schedule. Uh, the Hakone Unison, basically it's a, it's a hot spring theme park. They had special Godzilla bad set up, which was apparently this either dark green or black water. Uh, they had special Godzilla drinks and Toho Cinemas had these special Godzilla cups they were selling uh, when you went to see the movie there. And I never did end up seeing that damn Godzilla truck again. It, ju it just got away from me in Shinjuku and I, I didn't run after it because I thought, oh, I'll end up seeing it again. Nope. That driver, he turned down one road and I just never saw him again. I will be seeing this movie when it opens here in the U.S. Having the subtitles will help a great deal in clarifying a few things. If there's anything I feel I want to comment further on after seeing it with subtitles, maybe I'll make one last video titled Final Thoughts or something. I know it's kind of redundant at this point. Maybe just to talk about those things because maybe, I don't know, maybe I misunderstood some of the dialogue, and I may have gotten some things wrong, so I may need to do that, but we'll see. Here's another spoiler for you guys. The History of Godzilla 2014. So, that has really become a mammoth of a video. It's going to be over two hours long. The reason it is so long is because I talk about the time period between Final Wars and the Legendary movie and all the things I find relevant to the discussion. I am hoping and I'm going to try my best to get that completed by the end of the year. And then we're on to the history of Shin Godzilla, which I know a lot of you guys have wanted me to do for a while. Well, everybody, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy this movie as much as I did. God bless and take care.